Today I want to share some of the lessons I learned during a core practice of my winter retreat. That was learning how to sew bhikshuni robes. <laughs> Uh, during the winter retreat, it was the perfect time to learn how to do this because I would do it right after a meditation session when my mind was very clear and calm and focused, which is what I needed because I realized it was quite a complicated task. Um, but fortunately, I had several models to go from, old Bukshuni robes and Venerable Sangha Kadro's guidance when I ran into obstacles. My first uh, task was to cut the fabric, understanding how much to cut and how many sizes of patches and how many patches were needed, which I thought would be easy because I had the templates. But as I looked at the templates, I realized each one was a little bit different. So luckily I then turned to these excellent resources put out by Gompo Abbey, little booklets put out in the 90s that were giving directions of how to sew monastic robes, which I thought, great. I have directions, but the details were given in terms of Tibetan terms and Sanskrit terms <laughs> and, and based on the original um, directions were given by the Buddha, which were originally set to the Buddha's size, which the Buddha, I guess, was very big person. And one day he saw a monastic wearing very large robes and said very kindly, you can actually make robes fit to each person's size, not to my size. <laughs> but still the dimensions that they gave were in dimensions of finger breadth and hand span and another term and the arm span and something where your thumb and your finger, index finger is crossed. And that's how big the strips are supposed to be on the uh, bhikshuni robes. After scratching my head for a while, I finally just took the average of several different robes and <laughs> averaged it together. Um, being aware that I wanted to finish the robes in time for Katina was um, to be able to have the robes ready for Venerable Semke in the ceremony um, was very good practice on staying focused but not moving too quickly and making mis mistakes that would step me back further. So it was a very good practice in cultivating mindfulness of staying in the moment and introspective awareness that I had a lot of different steps to do in a limited time period. Um, especially I had to pay attention to being present in the moment and keeping my mind bigger in the bigger picture of what the steps were when I was placing the strips because they overlap and so I couldn't just pin them all into place and sew them all into place because sometimes I had to sew one underneath and then go back a few steps and sew another one underneath and realizing that they were all connected and I had to be very aware of which step was needed to complete it all at the same time but without getting just fixated on one step. Um, yeah, so it was just very good practice of seeing how everything is interlinked and that constant paying attention to the moment and then the big picture. Uh, which also applies when sewing, that you have to pay attention to what you're sewing, not, and the right strips of fabric are on the machine, not other strips that you don't want to get sewed at the same time. Um, and then also just staying aware that you couldn't get focused too detailed on each moment of stitching because then it kind of gets all wobbly. You have to remember, okay, I'm doing a really long strip and to keep, keep the machine moving in a smooth pattern. This also applies when cutting fabric. You want to make each cut clear, but it's also good not to get hung up on each little cut. You have to look at the end point of where you want to go to be able to cut in a straight line. If you get too fixated on the moment, you kind of wiggle all over and it's not very straight. So again, it's that focus in the moment, but looking at the big picture. Um, Another good dharma analogy I learned is that, the hard way, is that karma expands. Uh, when you're cutting a 10-foot piece of fabric, being off by a quarter of an inch makes a big difference in the end. And if it's not completely straight, that adds up. And so it's, again, an example of how uh, the ripple effect of being off by a few inches makes a big difference um, in the end of the process. 
uh, towards the end, I was, after weeks and weeks of, of doing the robe, I was getting close to, I had all the patches sewn together and I was ready to sew the um, robe together with a big seam to put it all together, which I was very close to the end. And I had the demo examples of what the final seam should look like, but I could not figure it out. I was, I took it apart and so I had the example, I had the uh, image of the final result but I didn't know the steps to do it. Yeah, so I could see the final result, but I had no idea what the steps were to take it. And then the opposite, which is the opposite of Dharma practice, which is, I don't really know what enlightenment is like, but we have excellent teachers and texts and teachings showing us the steps. But in this process of trying to figure out the steps, luckily we have YouTube. And... <laughs> So I, I knew what the final result I wanted to be, but I still didn't know what to Google. I didn't know what search, what uh, term to search. So I had to look through several different videos to see, okay, this is the type of seam that I want to do. And I thought it was really funny when the type of the seam that I wanted to do was called the self-bound seam. <laughs> um, so once I overcame this obstacle, I ran into another self-bound seam problem realizing that I had done a um, step out of sequence and needed to go back a few steps. But instead of going backwards, I wanted to just charge ahead and think, this won't really matter, I'll fix it later. Um, and so it was that self-bound, that focused mind of like, it's, it's not a big deal, I'll work with it later. That, um, of course, in the end, I realized I should have taken the time to just go back a few steps and it would have made it a lot smoother. So that valuable lesson of slowing down and thinking things through um, became very clear. Uh, while doing this practice, I became very aware of how rare and precious this opportunity was because the Tibetan Vinaya Bhikshuni lineage doesn't really currently exist. Um, today, the number of people sewing uh, Tibetan style robes for Bhikshunis is incredibly rare. So being that link between the Dharmaguptapka Vinaya monastic code of ethics and discipline and the, um, for the Chinese bhikshunis and then the Tibetan practice lineage that we follow makes me um, just realize how rare and precious this link is. Um, and so it, I felt very honored to be able to do that and all because I learned how to sew a prom dress in high school. So, <laughs> so you never know what causes and conditions you learn, what random skills you learn at a random time, how they'll help um, the Dharma spread in, in incredible ways. So I'm very incredibly um, grateful to have had this opportunity to do this 100,000 stitches nundro and to really bring the Dharma into every moment um, which could have been a, a daunting and tedious task. So I wish everybody much joy and patience and wisdom in turning their daily tasks into something that's nourishing and delightful as well. Thank you.